Houston, with its ever-expanding push of new businesses and communities, can sometimes feel like a concrete jungle. Our Justin Stapleton has more about efforts being done right here in Houston to make sure that the city and its communities will be sustainable for generations to come in a warmer climate. We all know that summertime here in Houston is blazing hot, but I bet you didn't know that there are certain areas that can be up to 17 degrees hotter than other spots. Here's why. The one thing we all know as Houstonians living in the country's fourth largest city is that there is a lot of concrete. Buildings, roads, neighborhoods. What once was rural farmland 80 years ago is now part of the sprawling, ever-expanding Houston community. Add on summer months that push the mercury into triple digits, and you've got a very large island of heat. These surfaces like roadways and concrete pathways and things, they not only hold on to the heat during the day, but then they release it at night. Since 1970, the city has warmed up the average nighttime temperatures by over five degrees. That's Jaime Gonzalez from the Nature Conservancy, an international group that's targeted Houston as one of 21 cities that they're helping to re-green urban spaces to help battle our intense heat. One of the things we know from the climate impact study that the city did last year and released is that we're gonna go from about 10 days a year that have feels like temperature of 105 to more than 70 days by mid-century. So what we're gonna to need to do is use as many surfaces of, as we can to absorb those extra floodwaters to cool down the city. Gonzalez's team has identified multiple areas across Houston that are demonstrably hotter than others based on their landscape or, in the case of one neighborhood, lack of landscape. What we found is Gulfton had the highest temperature by far of any neighborhood. It was 17 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than the coolest neighborhood that we measured during the heat campaign. So what that means is that pavements in that neighborhood are plus 120 degrees hot at a place where people are walking back and forth with families. So it really is uh, not just uncomfortable, but it's dangerous for people. And part of the reason is that they have fewer trees. And so what we find is a lot of times the hotter places, the places that are the most climate vulnerable, are also those neighborhoods that um, suffer from other forms of disinvestment. It's not just neighborhoods trying to find a way to cool, but one of the unofficial skylines of Houston, the Texas Medical Center, is also bringing back Texas prairies to the people. One of the really great things about plants is they're constantly moving water through their bodies. And when they do that, in order to evaporate the water out of their bodies, they have to take heat from the air. And so what they do is they cool everything around them. It's almost like having thousands of little air conditioners out here cooling this spot and the surrounding city. If we create a garden city, it's gonna be a better place to live, it's gonna be a more sustainable place to live, and people are gonna still be attracted here. The city is making progress here with projects like the Yolanda Black Navarro Buffalo Bend Nature Park near the Ship Channel. This former construction fill site is now full of tall, cooling grasses and ponds that offer a refuge for our coastal wildlife. Ed Pettit is a graduate researcher with Texas Southern University, specializing in environmental and climate justice. He's part of a project that studies the impacts of urban heat on the health and well-being of Houston. Heat is actually the number one weather-related killer in the U.S. More than hurricanes, more than tornadoes, more than flooding. And we need to find ways to cool down our cities because it especially impacts lower-income neighborhoods, communities of color, formerly red line neighborhoods, and it impacts the elderly and children, the people most at risk of heat stroke. And so we need to find ways to keep our communities cooler. As you might expect, regreening a city with a concrete maze in downtown takes many teams ready to tackle not just new construction, but old ideas about green buildings. I ask for developers and home builders and uh, residents is to plant a few more trees than code minimum. It's going to do nothing but help. Part of helping businesses break through the old way of thinking is by educating about how using Texas natural grasses can actually keep their cooling costs down. I interviewed Steve Stelzer on a green roof at the city of Houston's Green Building Resource Center. So you've got this one, two, wonderful combo with uh, helping with the urban heat island and keeping the temperatures low and you're keeping your roof surface uh, much longer live. So like a roof natural sunscreen almost. It is, it is. Completely, it's like wearing a hat. Look for projects like Greener Gulfton in the near future. It will add trees and nature-rich spaces to help cool down Houston's hottest neighborhoods. The only way that this is gonna work is that communities are up-powered to help 
put in all of these natural features like prairies and trees and wetlands to help do all of this great work for us. Uh, it's got to be sustainable. The kids have to learn about it. And, uh, and that way, it is going to be a, a real win for everybody. Curious if you live or work in a heat island? Well, you can find those maps on the forecasting change page at clickthehouston.com. All right, great stuff, Justin, thanks. So now we wanna check in with meteorologist Caroline Brown. She's near Lake Travis, uh, made the journey over there. I know, hi Caroline, it's good to see you. Um, I know the lake levels have been dropping, especially Travis. Uh, how's it impacting the whole lake life, the recreation, everything going on there? Well, I'll tell you what, Frank, the soil is bone dry and the water level is extremely low. But since we've been out here, folks are fishing, they're boating, they're having a great time on the water. However, park officials told us if the water drops another two to three feet, they're going to shut down this boat launch behind me. That could happen within the month. And this is happening not just here, but all across Texas. The city of Katy issued mandatory water restrictions last Friday, and it is many concerned about water usage. While it has been abnormally dry this year, we're doing significantly better than 2011. In 2011, Texas saw our worst drought in history that caused Lake Houston to drop to 60% capacity. This led to mandatory water restrictions across the Houston area. The city of Houston gets 86% of our water supply from the Trinity River into Lake Livingston and from the San Jacinto River into Lake Conroe and Lake Houston. As for now, we're doing okay. The reservoirs that supply water to Houston are all over 90% capacity, despite the severe drought. Lake Somerville in Washington County is only at 79% of capacity, which is low, but nowhere near the 39% capacity it reached in 2011. Across central and west Texas, conditions are more dire. Lake Medina, west of San Antonio, fell below 10% capacity this week, and there's no relief in sight. This extreme and exceptional drought is due to the lack of rainfall and the extremely hot temperatures. The average high temperature in July for Austin was about 102 degrees, and so far this month, they've been in the triple digits nearly every day. With high temperatures, soil is undergoing more evaporation, which means they lose moisture and retain more heat. Unfortunately, the hottest temperatures typically happen at the end of summer, so that heat is here to stay. This region has also seen well below average rainfall since last fall. Austin has only seen about 12 inches of rain so far this year, when they should have seen over 20 inches. Some Austin water authorities have enacted water restrictions, but if more rain doesn't come, more restrictions are likely on the way. Behind me is the Mansfield Dam. This forms Lake Travis and it's 19 feet below where it should be this time of year. In fact, it's one foot lower than it was this time last week. This drought is now record breaking. Inflows to the Highland Lakes are at historic lows, with January through July totals being the lowest in the history of these lakes. Not only are folks concerned about the waters left in the reservoir, but it can also cause really unsafe boating conditions. When the lakes drop, there's definitely, you know, structure and all that kind of stuff that's a lot closer. You know, some people think, you know, the lakes are deep and, um, you know, they can just drive 50 miles an hour across the middle of the lake and, you know, with no hazards. Um, but definitely when the lakes drop, there's sandbars that appear, there's, you know, little peninsulas that'll show up and, uh, you know, you can cruise across the lake and hit that kind of stuff and it's definitely dangerous. With peak hurricane season approaching, there is some hope. During the October flood of 2018, Lake Travis rose 26 feet in 24 hours. During heavy rainfall, Lake Travis can raise at a rate of over one foot per hour. Of course, we don't want all of that rainfall to come at the same time, but it's definitely needed, not just for recreational activities, but the towns of Leander and also Cedar Park get 100% of their public drinking water from Lake Travis. So Frank, we really need a pattern change to start filling up these lakes again. Thank, well, fingers crossed. So thanks so much for that information, Caroline. I know. Be careful getting back to Houston. All right, I'm with the stellar panel right here. And when we come back, we're going to answer your weather questions live from our studio. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.